Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. I had this bizarre dream within a dream. It was very inception. I'm dreaming that I'm in a massive sandstorm. I'm on some sort of a remote ocean beach area. I can tell, I, I, I intuit that there's a giant cliff next to me, although I can't even see it. So this feels extremely remote. I don't have a face covering, and yet somehow I am able to breathe as so much sand is pummeling my body. And I'm walking, trying to find what I believe is to be a cave, a haven of safety. And so I'm walking inch by inch, trying to find the cave. And all of a sudden, as I am walking in the sandstorm and I can hear the wind, all of a sudden, surrounding me, I hear Celine Dion, The Power of Love. Because I'm your lady and you are my man. It just surrounds me. And it was perfectly normal in the dream. <laughs> so as I'm listening to Celine, I finally find the cave. And inside the cave, there are hundreds and hundreds of people who have been waiting for me. They're like, oh, good. Seth was lost and now he is found. We are all in the cave together and we can ride out the storm. Bizarre. I wake up and Natalie is laying there and she's looking at me. And I said, oh, I had the most jacked up dream. What happened? And I told her the story of the sandstorm and Celine in the cave. And she's like, that's jacked up. That's crazy. And we had a good laugh about it. And then I woke up again and she was still asleep next to me. And I had not explained the dream. I had only dreamed I had explained the dream. Well, of course, now I'm paranoid. Is this some kind of infinite regress? Have I just, like, am I awake now? Are you here? Or am I dreaming that you are here? And I'm going to wake up and explain that you were here, but you weren't. And then I've got to explain the dream again and again. I'm having a moment. Dreams are bizarre. Anyway, I will wake up in the middle of the night and have had a wild one and say, I've got to remember this to tell people tomorrow. I wake up the next morning. It's gone. It's totally gone. I can't for the life of me remember the dream. Anyway, I remembered that one. Maybe it's because we watched the Celine Dion documentary. It's called I Am. And I didn't realize that her health problems had been so pronounced. And I, I'm a tremendous admirer of her talent. She's been an icon for 40 years. And whether you like the style of her music or not, I mean, there's no doubt she is an extremely talented performer. And uh, she has been through it. She has something called stiff person's disease, SPD. And so when the brain is stimulated, she will totally tighten up and spasm and seize. It's horrifying. She is in great pain. And it has caused her to not be able to perform. It has robbed her of her voice. It's just horrifying. And they took the cameras right into her life. I mean, she just allowed full access, including access to a tremendously traumatic moment when she had a seizure and she's just in horrible shape and your heart breaks and you think how cruel can life be when you have someone who is essentially born to make music and they are unable to do what they love. And anyway, it was it was very compelling. I recommend the documentary, but it is sobering. I think there, we were pretty choked up a couple of times, you know. 
but maybe that's why I had Celine on the brain. Things continue to go south in my home state of Oklahoma. Ryan Walters, you're killing me. You're killing me. Ryan Walters, the superintendent of public instruction, wants the Bible taught as history in this state. He's just terrifying. By the way, his Republican colleagues are saying nothing in protest. I just think, what is wrong with you people? And I know there have to be some Christians against Christian nationalism. Are they cowards? They just don't want to, like, rock the boat or look disloyal. But you know, there got to be some people whispering about this guy and how he's totally out of control and he's already bringing lawsuits upon the state. After mandating Christian Bibles in public schools, Ryan Walters has assembled this right-wing team to overhaul our social studies programs. On this team, Dennis Prager, who is the founder of PragerU. PragerU is not a university. It holds no classes. It has no accreditation. It is not a school. Dennis Prager is a right-wing talk radio host. He's one of the power players behind this effort. David Barton, an uncredentialed pseudo-historian and Christian nationalist, soundly debunked by credible experts in the field of history. Steve Deese, I think it's D-E-A-C-E, is it Deese or Deese? Steve is a college dropout and a former sports talk radio host who went into journalism for the Blaze Network. And, of course, the Blaze was founded by Glenn Beck, another right-wing radio host. And then there's Kevin Roberts. He is president of the Heritage Foundation, one of the organizations behind Project 2025. These are the people that he is having to retool and refit and degrade Oklahoma social studies curriculums. And it's terrifying. In some ways, I feel so helpless. I'm like, look, if these people aren't going to be challenged by their own party, and their own party is the one in power, this is an overwhelmingly strawberry red state. How unbelievably frustrating. And people keep asking, why don't you get out of there? Why don't you just leave? And I fantasized about it, but honestly, the cost of living prohibits us from going most places. And I really kind of feel like I need to hang here. You know, at least I'm a blue dot in the middle of a red state, but it is not easy. It is not easy. Anyone else feel that? I don't know. I've got a web call uh, let's see. I don't see a name. Are you with me, and can you hear me? Yeah, Seth, I can hear you. How you doing? This is Sprinkles with the uh, Reason Riders Atheist Motorcycle Association. How you doing? Sprinkles, welcome to the show. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So my question was regarding uh, your thoughts on the Satanic Temple introducing ministers into the schools out there in Oklahoma after the uh, recent debacle. I think the Satanic Temple is on to something. If we're going to have these Christian nationalists shoving religious dogmas down everybody's throats. And right now, we're, it's a crisis mode. We're trying to block it. But until we block it, if they're going to say we want religion in schools, I welcome the Satanic Temple. Fine. You want to put a cross up? You want to put the Ten Commandments up? You want to put a baby Jesus up? Let's bring in Baphomet. And let's put the Baphomet statue up as well and have after school Satan and all those things. So I support it. I don't know. What's your take on it? I support it as well. We recently had a bill out here in Arizona where, where I'm at, where they were trying to not allow anything satanic on the grounds of the state capitol where they have a Ten Commandments monument, of course. And the satanic temple out here pushed back really, really hard. And that bill did not pass because of that pushback. So. I think the the pushback and the uh, quote unquote scare tactics are unfortunately necessary, especially with Project 2025 at our doorstep. I kind of like TST. They're really good at turning the screw and they're good at turning everybody's uh, words and actions back on themselves. Yep. Agreed and agreed with the uh, blue vote in a, in a red state area as well. So uh, I'm right there. Um, All right, brother. So. Well, hang in there. Thanks for calling. All right. I appreciate you. Seth. Yep. Have a good one. See you later.
The Satanic Temple, you know, I would have been terrified of anything with Satan in the title. I wrote about this a couple of times in two of my books where I said if someone had walked up to my door when I was a devout Christian and they had been holding a copy of the Satanic Bible, which is the Church of Satan, that's different, but any sort of Satanic text, or they were holding a Ouija board, or had a statue of Beelzebub, something Satanic, I probably would not have allowed them into the house because it was evil. I wasn't going to allow that evil to cross the threshold of my life. Now, when I see Satan and satanic imagery, I just smile. I'm not threatened by it at all. Some of it's kind of awesome, right? I'm not afraid in any way. I'm totally liberated. And then when those who still believe in that evil, nasty devil see, I'm almost flippant about it. They become more terrified. That boy's playing with fire. Does he not realize the devilry that he is messing with? (laughs) And they just freak out. And I find that amusing as well. It's a liberation exercise to be able to say, I ain't scared no more. I've got AJ at 720. Thanks for calling. Hi, Seth. Growing up. High school football, our coach actually had a pregame prayer in the locker room all the time doing the Psalm 23-4, which is that, yay, though I walk through the valley of shadow. Wait a minute. Was this uh, a a public school? Yes. Sorry, public school. Growing up in Wyoming, so very red and fairly religious in general. But yeah, public school. So this is something that I was a teenager on. All my other teammates are bowing their head with their eyes closed, and I'm one of the few if only one looking around, eyeballing everybody side to side and just not participating, but being in it the whole time. I'm interested in, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death before a football game. Was this like a warrior's cry? Yes, I believe so. It's trying to make us face our fears and yeah, get out there. So do you think the other team was having a similar prayer? You know, yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, give us victory. And maybe those prayers sort of cross the field, cancel each other out. (laughs) Probably, but I'm sure they weren't. No one was thinking that. Well, thanks for calling. Thanks for sharing our concerns about the infection of superstition and public education. Hang in there. Okay. Uh, Okay. Sounds good. Thank you, sir. Yeah. We'll see you later. Six, one, two. Is it Nicholas? Yes, it is. Nicholas, what's on your mind? What do you want to talk about? So, yeah, I used to be uh, a fundamentalist, now pretty far left. I used to actually be somewhat of a Christian nationalist, although I wouldn't admit it at the time. I actually used to listen to Steve Dace, and I now call him the angry potato. Um, (laughs) He's always frustrated at something. He is very... If you turn him on mute and watch him get angry, it it is somewhat comical. His rhetoric is very Christian nationalist. It is very much Bible-centered. He's got this Theology Thursday thing where he misinterprets a Bible. or He'll dedicate whole shows to clamping down on gay people or LGBTQ and claiming that we're trying to trans the kids or something like that. One of the things that I very much have learned is that you cannot change your sexuality. I tried for 15 years and I prayed, I cried, I did everything that I possibly could and I just could not. not. Now it's currently a battle of trying to uh, persuade my family over. Luckily, that is starting to work. My mother and father are kind of starting to open up showing them that I'm still the same person, but I'm a lot happier now that I've actually come to terms with this. Progress is progress, and you can't expect them to flip overnight. I had to basically dig myself out of the hole that I had kind of created for myself. And another thing to acknowledge is that my parents also, because I was very angry with my parents for about half a year, and I then realized They grew up in the same sort of scenario, but it didn't bother them because they weren't gay. They weren't an outlier. So they very much are also victims of the very thing that they are putting onto other people. You doing okay these days? You hanging in there? 
I am doing better than I ever have emotionally. I, like I said, after I came out, it's been about a year now and I am doing very well emotionally. I am, I feel free. Christianity ended up being this anchor that kind of, I felt like I was anchored to the bottom of the ocean and the chain wasn't quite long enough, but the anchor is very heavy. And so I would go with the tides, I would get pulled underwater and now I've cut that anchor loose and I'm free to steer my vessel wherever I please. So I'm doing very well. I appreciate you asking. That's fantastic. Well, Nicholas, you are valid and your life is yours to live and you inspire me. And I appreciate the call today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Seth. See you later. When I got out of religion, one of the habits I had to break when I, I would talk about the gay lifestyle, which is how we spoke about it. Yeah, the gay lifestyle. And even then, I wasn't cognizant of what I was saying, really. I mean, yes, I saw it as rebellion against nature, right? It's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. I was that guy. But when I left the faith, I was still using the phrase, and someone had to correct me, you know? When you know better, you do better. And they were like, well, it's, it's an orientation. It's not a lifestyle. Lifestyle implies a choice, well, you know, I didn't choose to be attracted to so-and-so or such-and-such or a certain gender, etc. That is hardwired into me. It is part of the natural world. So when you say lifestyle, that sort of, um, I don't know, it gives a little bit of fuel to those who say that it's a choice instead of an orientation. And I had to make that adjustment in my own life. I also appreciate the fact that Nicholas sees his parents not just perpetrators of bad ideas, but victims of bad ideas. I spoke about this a little bit on my Facebook page, and it's so unpopular with a lot of people who just want to go hard. They just don't see the perpetrators of harm in three dimensions. Let me read this, and you can agree, disagree. Let me have it in the comment section. I said, this isn't a popular opinion, but I'm convinced we'll never build a better future without speaking to the humanity of those with bad ideas. Yes, we should be outraged at the outrageous, but empathy, grace, and compassion are not the enemies of justice. They're not a cheat, weakness, or enabling. And in this toxic, fuck-you culture of zero-to-crazy, self-righteous tantrums, someone has to be the adult in the room. As I emerged from my Fox News evangelical cocoon, I was a human being with a future worth salvaging. And I moved my needle only when I didn't feel like I'd get destroyed. The world is complex. People are complex. And yes, it's possible for someone to be both a perpetrator of harm and a victim of harm. Indoctrination is real and it runs deep. Those everyday people need an introduction to the better world. They need tools. They need rescue. And I posted a quote by Carl Sagan, and I'll just read it here. He said, in the way that skepticism is sometimes applied to issues of public concern, there is a tendency to belittle, to condescend. To ignore the fact that, deluded or not, supporters of superstition and pseudoscience are human beings with real feelings, who, like the skeptics, are trying to figure out how the world works and what our role in it might be. Their motives are, in many cases, consonant with science if their culture has not given them all the tools they need to pursue the great quest. Let us temper our criticism with kindness. None of us comes fully equipped. I post that and immediately people are like, well, I'm not going to be kind to Nazis. I swear, it's just so difficult to talk to so many of these people. I find myself frustrated. It's like you're not hearing me. Plenty of calls still to come on whatever's on your mind. Short break. Right back. If 
you haven't checked out my second show, we'd love to have you subscribe on all major podcast apps, True Stories with Seth Andrews. Most of these run about seven minutes and they can be anything. Ancient history, weird news, stupid criminals, celebrity trivia, I mean, whatever. Just a potpourri for you. True Stories with Seth Andrews. And thanks so much. I've got Scott making an online call. Are you with me, Scott? I'm here. Can you hear me? I sure can. What's on your mind? I'm wondering if you think this this topic I put in here is fair. So the topic I put in was, I think secular people, secular or atheist or skeptic people who are disinterested in supporting humanist groups or congregations are in some ways similar to what I'm calling I've got mine conservatives, the people who don't want to pay taxes or services uh, for services that they don't need themselves. So they're the spiritual kind of equivalent of, I don't need a community, so I'm not going to support communities. But there are other people out there in the world who do need these communities. And from my perspective, these alternate communities would be stronger if more people were supporting them, even if they weren't the immediate people that would benefit from them. Is that making sense? It does. I think we're talking about so many millions of people, the non-religious, the atheist, the agnostic, the seculars, and I think people disengage for a lot of reasons. I think there are some who are like, ah, it doesn't bother me any, it doesn't, no skin off my teeth, what am I going to engage for? Which is, I think, what you're addressing, that whole, ah, you know, screw it, I've got mine, my life's not affected, it doesn't relate to me personally. Do I think those people exist? Sure. But I also see out there so many other things. There are those disenfranchised, and they feel like it's not going to make any difference, no matter what they do, it's... It's all going to hell. We're circling the drain. I'm just going to batten down the hatches, maybe find a a lawn chair to watch the decline of civilization. (laughs) You know, nothing matters. Nothing means anything. I think there are some who are overwhelmed, so they don't know where to begin. Uh, I'm not a psychologist, but I think human beings are complex and their reasons for not engaging are complex. But I find myself frustrated, probably like you are, because with democracy and decency on the bubble and with these superstitious zealots and the power worshipers on the front line steamrolling over the rights and liberties and humanity of other people, I feel like if there's any time people need to get off the bench, it's now, and I get frustrated that they do not. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I've heard some other sort of prominent voices in the sort of atheist skeptic community when things like this come up, say things like, well, I don't feel a need to meet with other people on a Sunday, or I don't, I I feel my needs through other things. I have hobbies and stuff like that. Well, that may be something a little bit different. There are those who may say, I don't require a community to get what I want out of being alive. You know, there. Are, I think we're mostly a communal species, but some have been burned by church communities and they're kind of gun shy about joining an oasis or a free thought yeah, or humanist sure. or secular group. And I get that. I empathize with that. And there are other people where they're more independent. They don't really need it in their own lives. But I think that kind of choice not to join a group because I simply am not interested, I don't really want to, is different than, well, I'm not going to engage with activism because it doesn't matter or because it doesn't affect me personally. I think those may be two different conversations. True. Yeah. I'm a little frustrated with the the independent ones. You know, we're all Herding cats is the analogy, all going our own way. So it's hard to organize and create progress and good in the world when on the other side of things, they all seem to be in lockstep. So it it creates the sense of frustration. If we could maybe, even if you're a little bit uncomfortable with it, try to support some of the organization or try to, you know, if we can organize our resources better, there's all sorts of groups around the place. Like you mentioned Oasis, there's Ethical Society, Sunday Assembly, all sorts of things. And they're out there and they're trying to make the world a better place. And I just kind of want to make a case that people should look into it more and support them if they can. I think you're absolutely right. Good stuff, Scott. Thanks for calling. Yep. Thank you. All right. See you. 
I hear some of that. I'm not a joiner. You're not going to make me be a part of a group. Group think, ah, I left that all behind. It's, it's not just a choice to be more of, I hate the word loner because it sounds like a pejorative. You know what I mean? You don't necessarily want to, to be a part of an organization, and which is valid, but it's the whole well. Anytime you join a group, you're a member of the herd. You're guilty of group think. And I just think that's crazy. We're more effective together. I think life is, in most cases, more enjoyed when we share it together. And uh, there are a lot of great groups out there, secular and free thought groups. I've been watching the uh, work that Will Judy and the folks at Secular Houston have been doing down in Texas. Man, they're wiring in and getting people involved politically as the conservative evangelical zealots are going after the school boards and the mayoral races and trying to affect local politics so that it might propel up into regional state national politics they're on the front lines doing great things and anybody who support secular values and state church separation is welcome to participate. And that's a great group. And even if you didn't want to join the group, you could donate a few bucks or find another way to support it. And I'm guessing there are probably organizations in your relative zip code that might be doing the same thing. Don't reject it because it is a group. Because sometimes groups can get a hell of a lot more done and we are more effective as a team. I've got Katie at 678. Katie, are you with me? I am, Seth. How are you today? Fantastic. What's on your mind? I know they're out there, but basic mainline Christianity is not considered to be a cult. And it isn't by the bike model. But I have two nieces that I I swear they, they behave as if they belong to a cult. They don't have... Any social life outside their church, church friends, church activities, there's nothing outside of their church. I actually think Christianity is a cult, at least fundamentalist Christianity. It is an authoritarian model. There is a savior figure. There is a truth with a capital T. There is behavior monitoring and modification. There is blaming and shaming for anybody who does not toe the line. It is an insular culture where if you go outside, you might be in danger or receiving lies from the devil or deceivers. No, I I think Christianity fits. And I think all the major mainstream theistic religions are, in fact, cults, regardless of how large they may be. Uh, Thank you for that, because actually I've been leaning in that way for a long time, but then I I keep being told, no, 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 they don't fit the Biden model, but Well, I mean, you're referring to the uh, model put together by cult expert Stephen Hassan. BITE stands for behavioral control, information control, thought control, and emotion control. So behavior, information, thought, emotion, B-I-T-E. And I'm not saying that's invalid. I'm just saying if we look at the definition of cults, often they are seen as fringe They are seen as small, well outside the mainstream. But if you look at the characteristics of a cult, they actually can apply to Christianity, Islam, etc. All you do is multiply the members. So I think the atmosphere, the culture, the dogmas, the control, those types of things, they are the same. And in my mind, it qualifies Christianity, at least in a fundamental Bible literalist sense. I do see it as a large cult. Okay, Katie? Okay, and uh, one other question, if you have time. Sure. You and I know that there's not a four-year-old that was within the realm of Christianity that can't recite the Lord's Prayer, and it's plastered on walls, recited inside, outside, everywhere. But if you ask any of these people what the verses just prior to the Lord's Prayer says, and not one of them can tell you, and I don't remember hearing any minister preach about those verses. That's from the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said to go to your closet and pray. Do not pray in public. Do not even pray in the synagogue. And none of them know this. And whenever you see a lot of these posturing zealot types doing performative prayers, 
They're standing outside the gates of the halls of power, and they drop to their knees. No, Lord. Oh, we dedicate this nation to you, goodness. And and you're like, uh, have you read the book of Matthew? I understand totally what you're talking about. So I appreciate you so much, Katie. Thank you for calling. Thanks for being a part of the community. Have a good one, okay? You too. All right, we'll see you later. I mean, if I'm going to confess, although I'm familiar with both, I never in my brain connected those two, so I must admit uh, guilt's not the word. I'll admit to ignorance. It is uh, interesting to read the verse. Let me just read the whole thing. Matthew chapter 6, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. And if I skip down to verse 5, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners. And then, of course, it goes down to verse 9 and starts the Lord's Prayer, which was taught to us as a song. A great way to brand it into somebody's brain, make it a piece of music. You know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We we actually would sing it sometimes in church, which now I I think about it actually does seem a little bit culty. I've got Diane, 225. Are you there? Yes, I am. Hello, Seth. So glad you called. What do you want to talk about? I was just thinking about how religious trauma is so sneaky. While you're still in the religion, you consume so many harmful ideas, and you just buy into them and don't realize the damage it's doing. And I get concerned thinking about my religious family members, and they don't see any harm in the things that they're pushing, but I can't believe that it's not doing harm to them. Can you describe the type of religion that they practice? Yes. uh, Fundamentalist Christianity here in the South. I live in Louisiana. So Adam and Eve and Noah built the ark and Jonah spent Mm -hmm. three days inside the whale and Jesus was born in a manger kind of thing? Yes. Um, Bible literalist and young earth creationist. I know for myself, I just, a couple weeks ago, I came out to my parents as both an atheist and a member of the LGBTQ community. And one thing that I noticed is when I told them I didn't believe in God, my dad got up and hugged me. When I told him that I was gay, he threw his hands in the air and said, oh, I really didn't want to hear that. But there was a bigger reaction to the homosexuality thing than even the not believing in God. And he's a pastor. So I would think that logically he'd be more upset that I rejected the belief in God than the other stuff. That's pretty gutsy to go in and drop two bombs on him like that (laughs) face-to-face. Had you been wrestling with the decision to come out for a while? Yeah. uh, I deconverted from Christianity about two years ago, and I didn't even realize about my sexuality until like January of this year. Just the the messages from the church had made me repress it so much. I didn't even know it about myself. I was shocked whenever I realized that I wasn't straight, even though I had never really had any interest in guys. When you were a believer, there must have been that tumult going on. I mean, there's a dissonance happening uh, where uh, did you, I mean, don't let me pry too deeply, but I wonder how does someone deal with, I'm not attracted to men when you are in a culture that probably expected you to find a good man, get married, pop out a few kids, and raise some Christians, right? There was some dissonance, and I look back, and I can't believe that it flew under the radar for so long. But at the same time, the thing for girls raised in purity culture is you're very virtuous if you don't want to do anything with a guy until you're married. And I never got in a position where I was looking at marriage with a guy, so it was kind of almost a virtue signaling thing for me. Like, I don't want to do any of that because it's bad and evil. (laughs) When I came out of the faith, logically, I knew that hell wasn't real. Emotionally, I was still terrified for a long time. So logically in your mind, you know that this is who you are. But are you still dragging some of those chains from your religious past? Definitely. 
Like it's, it's getting better. I've been in therapy with a great person uh, that I found from the secular therapy project. So she's been awesome and affirming and she's been able to understand the religious trauma angle. And I've been making a lot of progress, but it's, it's still challenging. Well, don't rush yourself. Give yourself some time. Give yourself some oxygen. Give yourself some grace. You are the product of years and years of indoctrination. But the people who said that who you are is aberrant or perverse or a sin, those people who wrote the Bible, they didn't know anything about anything. Diane, they didn't know what the stars were. They didn't know what germs were. They didn't understand diseases like epilepsy. They didn't know that the earth revolves around the sun. They didn't understand so much about so much, and yet here they are supposedly writing perfect truths. They didn't know anything, and they don't have any propriety over who you are. I think you are to be celebrated. I think who you are is remarkable. I am struck by your courage to have that conversation with a pastor father and your mother and just to come clean. I know it's a difficult journey, but you've decided that's your journey, and that's huge. And I just, I got your back. This whole community has your back. You are valid just the way you are. Are you hearing the sound of my voice, Diane? Yes, thank you, Seth. All right. We got you. And and if, uh, you know, anything else happens, a new chapter in your story, I'd want to hear about it. So you, you have your people call our people and we'll talk again, okay? All right, thanks. All right, thank you. Whew. Have you heard that before? Someone said my parents were more traumatized when I came out as gay than when I came out as an atheist. I'm trying to think, had I been non-hetero, which would have traumatized my parents more? I don't know. I are mean, pretty homophobic. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I mean, it might have been an equal, free, equal time freak out. 619, I don't see a name. Yeah, my name is uh, Saul from San Diego. I am a long time uh, listener to your podcast. I love your show. I came out from um, Islam. I I, uh, I was a Muslim. I'm an ex-Muslim. I was converted as a Muslim from Sunni to Shia. And later I tried to study Christianity. I delved in. I didn't like it either. And I discovered later that America is unfortunate because we still have this conservative thing going on here. Like, I was for a long time a believer that Christianity was different from Islam, but going through politics here, I discovered that Christianity is just another fundamentalist religion, just like Islam. And what the Supreme Court did recently, for example, when they give the president all the powers, like a king, that reminded me of Islamic countries. So that even made me feel more sorry for this great country going down, like ending, I hope, and it will not end like that, in a dictatorship, a Christian fundamentalist group ruling over everything. But I don't know, like, what do you think? I mean, do you think that Christianity could be the curse that could kill this democracy? Oh my gosh. Um, Let me make sure I'm understanding your point. Having come out of Islam and you have seen these authoritarian Islamic theocracies, religious dictatorships, you are seeing us trending toward a religious dictatorship in the United States, except here it would be sort of framed as a Christian nation. Did I get that right? Yes, exactly. I don't think it fits in a box, but I do, in my own mind, see two major gears in the machine. One, there are Christian fundamentalists who know nothing about our history. They've never read the Constitution, at least properly. They do think that we are a Christian nation that belongs to their specific deity. So I do think there are many true believers at play, but I also agree with journalist and author Catherine Stewart, who has written the book, The Power Worshippers. I think a lot of people have weaponized Christianity for power. Many of them are atheists, 
but they understand that if you invoke God and you sort of stoke people's fears and speak the language of zealotry, that you can obtain and then consolidate power. They understand the power of saying that God wants this. I'm just his messenger. And so I think those two gears are really the main ones driving it. True zealotry and a quest for power. And they kind of bleed into each other as well. Does that sound right to you? Do you have something else that you think is playing a major part? Yes. Uh, thank you for your point. I, I think that the problem is that uh, Republicans are... Like, for example, they're against having education available to everyone in this country. And uh, that's exactly what religion needs. An ignorant populace, of course, will be easy to control. And also the rich, uh, he doesn't mind, like, giving the ignorant people some religious drugs so they can live with it. So they don't care, like, uh, about having a better nation. And I just want to make last point is that Americans don't have the experience I went through. I have seen religion used even by some secular people, like some people calling themselves secular, yet they pay millions of dollars to mosques and the religious clerics in order to keep people under control. So I appreciate your show, uh, Seth, and I love you. I love your show, and I I wish you all the success. Thank very you so kind. much. I'm glad yeah. you escaped Islam, and uh, you keep kicking out there, okay? Okay, thank yeah. you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Christianity at its core is an authoritarian model, and I think that's one of the reasons why so many of these devout Christians who know really nothing, I say they're devout emotionally, right? They are those people who they may go to church on Sunday and they live pretty much religion-free lives the rest of the week, except for maybe praying over the mashed potatoes kind of thing. Maybe they wear the cross necklace, but they claim Christianity and we do Christian things and we have Christian friends and Christian values and this is a Christian nation and whatever the Christian nation candidate tells us we will do because he is God's man. Well, I think these are people primed for authoritarianism. This is a command handed down that you will obey. It's a way of surrendering thinking, surrendering having to navigate the complex on your own. You sit back and you're spoon-fed what to do next. I also think there is a suspiciously Old Testament vibe to the Savior King narrative when it comes to Donald Trump. These Christians, many of them, do not just want a Christian country that puts them at the head of the table. I think they want Old Testament justice doled out to everybody they find icky. I, I think they, many of them, are gleeful at the idea of taking those brown people at the border and splitting them away from their families. And those icky gay people, let's make their marriage illegal and maybe even make it a crime to be gay. Those people who have aborted babies, they are the enemies of God. Those murderers, put them in prison, execute them. They see an Old Testament kind of what they call justice going on, and they, they're they gleeful about it. Forgiveness? Nah, it's punishment. It's blood in the streets. And you know what? The infidels, they had it coming. And if that sounds strangely like Islamic regimes... Yeah, it absolutely does. These types of shows are great ways for us as a community to interact with each other. And we will take more of your calls in just a second. I'm going to be in Fort Worth and Houston this weekend. I was looking ahead and how many Bible Belt or Jesus-y areas are on my speaking stop list? Because with Kentucky coming up, it's going to be in the Lexington area. Bentonville, Arkansas. <laughs> Arkansas! Hell, I thought Tulsa or Oklahoma was 
Jesus see. But man, you know what? I spoke in Little Rock recently and I'm driving back. I got Natalie on the car phone or whatever we're talking. And uh, I looked to my left. There was this big pasture and there were, no kidding, like 50 alternating signs. Trump, make America great again. Trump, make America great again. Over and over and over and over and over. And I was telling Natalie, wow, another few miles, another pasture, and again, another 50 alternating flags. So this must have been property owned by the same guys or the neighbors called each other and like, let's try to extra MAGA the highway. <laughs> let's just brand it even further. And I saw billboards and there's cross statues everywhere. Have you seen those turn or burn billboards where you're supposed to call the 1-800 number? You know, will you go to heaven or hell? And they've got hell in fiery font. You're supposed to dial a number. Has anyone ever called that number? I find myself looking at the tour schedule going, some of these people must crawl to these events in the prone position because they're afraid they're going to get shot. So... Uh, Fort Worth on Saturday, Houston Sunday, coming up at Sarnia, Toronto. I'll be in Lexington, Knoxville's coming up, uh, Bentonville, and others. SethAndrews.com slash events for all those details. I've got Hans from Germany calling online. Hans, thanks for being here. What's on your mind? Hey, how's it going? I'm Um, well. Just out of curiosity, what what denomination did you come out of? What do you think is trapped I got 31 flavors, man. I went to a Baptist school. My father was ex-Lutheran, and my mother was a Pentecostal. So I sort of dabbled in both the conservative and the more kind of wild and crazy kind of Christianity. And did you read your Bible often? I did. Interesting. Did you follow Jesus' words often? What he said? Did I follow what? Did he follow Jesus' words? Did I try to follow Jesus' words? words well yeah, let me see because let me, if you would have then you would have never left the church probably because say, he specifically goes through let me say it this way i attempted to be a good person to tell the truth to have compassion for others okay and i also well, that's received not what jesus says jesus didn't on, say that hold be on, a good person. hold on i saw christ as a messenger of charity of humility of peace and goodness and i tried to emulate that in my own life i also held to the great commission go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to all the nations so i was rather evangelical in that way i was always sort of puffing christianity so in that way yeah i wanted to emulate the teachings or what i felt were the teachings of christ okay well did you follow everything he said I don't. I can't recall everything he said. Why do you ask? Well, because he says specifically that we need to build our faith on a strong foundation. Otherwise, when the first thing comes that will make you faulty in your faith, it'll get lost away easily. So, but it sounds like you didn't build your faith on a strong foundation. You just had you had a very shallow faith. It sounds like. I see on your uh, call screening that you were disowned by a Christian family when you left the church. Is that why you're calling? Yeah, it's a separate topic. Like I guess a, yeah, Catholic Church. Okay. When you left the Catholic Church. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about the church that you left and why you left. No, that's well, let's talk about you, because it sounds like you didn't actually follow what Jesus said. What's the Peter just said? You don't know anything about me. I was a true Well, blue I do know you had a very shallow faith because when the first thing came around you you abandoned it. When the first thing came around, do you mean literally almost a decade of examining no, feeling katie dawson your child i'm going to put you on mute hans you don't know anything about me my journey wasn't a blink of an eye journey it wasn't overnight i wasn't blasé or flippant about my religion i was traumatized at the idea that what i had long believed was not true there were major consequences When I left, I learned more about the history of my religion and what the Bible said as I deconstructed than I ever did when I was a blind faith believer. And I reject this idea that you can call and you can just say, well, I know more about you. I know why you left and it is illegitimate. You're obviously a really shitty Christian because you're saying all that. So 
that's really sad, man. Well, Hans, I know, I know you is, is your I, first I know name you Hans from Germany? Because this doesn't sound like a Hans from Germany. Where are you from, really? This is Hans from Germany. What do you know about me? I, I couldn't understand you. Say it again. You may be a troll. Fix your setup, man. Yeah, I think you may be a troll. Forgive me, everybody. I didn't pick up on that. At first, I thought, well, maybe I'm not making a connection. But I don't believe that was a Hans from Germany. I think it may have just been someone seeking attention, which unfortunately is sometimes the nature of online pot. Well, actually broadcasts in general. Hans or whoever you are, whatever attention you seek, I hope you find it somewhere. 757, I've got Hannah. Thanks for calling. What's on your mind? Hello. Ah, this is my first time calling on the show, so I'm very excited. You're doing great. Um, doing fine. Okay, so just to give you a little background about me, um, I'm 30, and for the past three years, I've deconstructed from Christianity. So at least 20 years of my life, maybe a little bit more than that, I was like in it. But now I kind of say like I'm an agnostic atheist because while I don't believe that there is a God, I can't really prove one way or the other that it does or does not exist. My question, well, there's two questions actually, because I can't, I don't, I don't know, but I really value your opinion. My first question would be, do you believe that the figure of Jesus did exist at some point on this earth? And then the other question is, you know, as you know, when you first come out of Christianity and you learn like a bunch of stuff, one of the things you face is anger. And I faced a lot of that. And um, it's only been like three years for me, like I said, so I'm sure I still have a lot to learn. But I still feel the anger at times. I find myself rolling my eyes at a lot of stuff that I see going on in the world. Even like when I pass a church or like a sign that it just, it just, I just feel like the anger is not very strong, but I just, it's like the sense of, ugh, like, come on, like seriously, <laughs> there are adults out here still being brainwashed or we like seriously i i just and you're much further along at this than i am so i just was curious if those feelings ever go away or does it come with more healing or sorry that was like a lot um <laughs> i got you i'm yeah. totally tracking and i can relate first okay. of all i don't really care what you call yourself i wouldn't get hung up on atheist agnostic i mean if you don't believe there's a god or you've been shown no reason to believe you're an atheist but some people are more comfortable with agnostic because i don't know that there couldn't be something out there okay fine i'm a seeker i i don't know i don't have any idea i'm still kind of digging around to find out i don't care i mean we often trip on labels so i wouldn't beat yourself up over what you call yourself just take the journey was jesus a real guy i don't know i don't have any idea i mean it, very possible that the god myth was based on a charismatic guy who lived in that time but we know that no contemporary historian recorded anything about a jesus the Gospels weren't written. I think the first one, it was in the late 70s CE. And, you know, was he a myth? Was he borrowed from other previous deities? Or was he once a guy and then the legend sprung up from him? I, I don't know. And uh, finally, on the subject of being angry, anger is totally understandable. Sometimes we find ourselves apologizing. I can't get past the angry phase. I'm pissed off. I wasted time. People are so dumb. Or I'm being judged and they're the one who believes in talking donkeys. You know, they're the ones who are being bigoted against my friends and the people I care about. And they're doing battle with my values. And, and I, of course I'm angry. And I think, Hannah, you have every right to be angry. Don't apologize for it. Don't feel guilty about it. Don't feel like you're doing deconstruction wrong. I think anger is part of the process. But I will say, after four years on my end, I finally started to get over that hump just a little bit. Not that my anger is gone, but that it kind of hits differently. 
I'm processing it differently. I'm approaching people differently. I'm guessing we're taking a road trip together, Hannah. Is that what's going on? Yeah, I'm sorry. I guess I have bag of signal where I'm at. I'm so sorry. You're doing fine. Uh, As long as Um, I can totally understand what you're saying and the listeners can as well, I think it's absolutely fine. Here's the one challenge that I have. I think anger is a powerful motivator, and that's a good thing. Anger can also eat us from the inside. It can turn to this kind of non-stop teeth gritting rage that is destructive. It's destructive to us. It doesn't necessarily help us to change the world. It makes everything harder. And that's a tough line to draw. So as I am someone who cares about other people and I want to see a better world and I'm upset about injustice, I'm angry about that. But I've also finally come to a point when I've been able to channel it differently and also find a little bit of balance to embrace the good and not allow my rage to eat me alive. Does that make sense? All right. Thank you so much. I I totally agree with that. (laughs) Time is a, an amazing healer, but it's a yeah. long journey. For some, I'm telling you, that if you look at the temperature of my work when I first came out and started this channel, I was a hell of a lot nastier. I was more sarcastic. I don't know if nasty is the word, but I was just pissed off and I was going hard all the time. Boom, boom, boom. And it took me a while to get over that speed bump. And that's okay. And so do it on your timing, but I think better days are going to come for you. All right. Thank you. I, I really appreciate you. And, you know, I think it, <laughs> I think you're really strong and brave for putting up with trolls. And I really thought you handled <laughs> that with, uh, I don't know if grace is a, a weird it's word to good. use, but I mean, you did, you handled it with grace and it was perfect. Um, so I just really admire that and how you listen to people. See, I may not have done that five years out of the faith. I may have popped an O-ring on the guy. I may have You may have seen the vein come out of my forehead. But time is a great healer. So there is hope, Hannah. Yeah. And you drive safe out there, okay? Thank you. All right, we'll see you. I tend to uh, resist this idea that not freaking out and losing your mind and cussing people out and calling them names is somehow a sellout. I just I think so many times actually that's the easy way. It's easy to knee jerk. It's easy to surrender to your first emotional instinct and to pound on the table and to call people names and to lose your mind. I mean, any child can do that. And I'm not saying already there's someone who's going, well, Seth says we shouldn't be angry about again the Nazis. This is always what they lead with, right? No, I'm, I'm just saying, I've been going through this on social media with the whole punch a Nazi crowd. Well, I'm going to punch as many. I think Nazis need to be punched. Just sucker, just punch them and make them afraid to show their faces. They'll never understand reason. They only understand violence. We have to speak their language. We have to get down in the gutter. And I just, huh. this is not, it's not how we fix the world. We tried taking the high road. Now we need to go and just do battle. Grab them by the throat. Any child can surrender to their base instincts. And I just don't think assault is how we fix the world. That's not a position of weakness or acquiescence or enabling. I think we need adults in the room. And there are a ton of ways to be strong without becoming these fist-flailing, lawless, tantrum-throwing children and excusing it because, well, I just have to. They made me do it. Anyway, that's probably a whole other show. The punch a Nazi crowd, I swear to you. Well, Seth wants to go soft on the Nazis. (laughs) Seth Seth thinks we should all gather around and sing Kumbaya with Nazis. Did I say that? That's what binary thinking does. Extremist thinking. And don't believe that we don't have extremist thinking in every tribe, every group, every community, every circle, every culture. You will find the mainstream, you'll find the spectrum, and you'll find the extremes. 
And the extremes are so desperate to justify extremism. No, I don't think we fix the world by sucker punching people in the street, no matter how awful they are. Anyway, I'll let you chew on that. So I'm going to call it a day. I will see you back here. Actually, I'll see you on the road and I'll see you back here next time. And uh, take care. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring the Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.